Welcome to Small Biz Life, episode 114, Building an Audience. Does this sound familiar? Oh my God, I have so much to do today. Don't forget to breathe. But I have almost 400 emails in my inbox and 30 phone calls to make. Have you looked into getting a virtual assistant yet? Oh, and I need to schedule all my social media posts. Did you drink anything today? I had coffee. Did you eat today? Did I mention coffee's a bean? This is Small Biz Life. Hey guys, welcome back to Small Biz Life. If you're a returning listener, thank you so much. If you're new to the show, welcome. We're happy to have you. My name is Kristen Ingram. And I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm a CPA. And I'm an IT supernova. Wow. That's good. Okay. Um, We are a husband and wife team of small business owners who are here to help you cut the crap out of your business. And I know that you know, one of the things that I think frustrates a lot of business owners mm-hmm. is this concept of, you know, building an audience or a tribe or whatever you want to call it. And if you're looking for the two biggest things to do to help with this, go back to the last two episodes. Right. So, you know, so we've talked about, you know, we've talked about launching, right? And we said that you need to have people, you need to have an audience in order to launch. Um in last week's episode, we talked about how to, um, how to you know build your avatar or why you should build an avatar, mm-hmm. um, in order to you know be able to speak the language, right? And so this episode is all about building the mm-hmm. audience. And this is more of a nuts and bolts episode, but really, typically the two biggest mistakes we see people make are in the other two episodes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So. You know, but I think this is something I th- I know in the beginning this was something like I was really frustrated with, um, and you know we have we have one site um, that gets a tremendous amount of just organic traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, that site is probably going to hit like a million visitors this year. Oh, it's it's going to crush a million. Yeah. So. But like, but the thing is, where's like there was no audience building. It just organically kind of happened. And so, I mean, it really did. A lot of it's SEO, and it's SEO that was out of our control. Right. So it was organic SEO. Right, it's organic SEO. Um, and then when we started, you know, we started Small Biz Life, it was slow building an audience. Mm-hmm. But the, the cool thing is that, you know, I want to start by saying that it's not about the size of your audience. Mm-hmm. It's about the quality of your audience. I was talking to someone just the other day, and they were talking – about uh, they do a lot of Facebook lives and they're talking about getting like 700 to 800 uh, views uh, for the previous week's videos. And then they were trying to assure me that that was an okay number. It's small, but it's a good, and I I just want to be like, stop. I don't, that that's an audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you, you know, you are in a classroom and have 20 people in a classroom and you teach four classes a week, you don't come anywhere close to that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And that's kind of, you know, that's the way that I've always kind of looked at it is the audiences that we have built through our online channels. I can teach way more people with a podcast Mm -hmm. than I could possibly do in a day. Yes. Right. So like right now. So if you listen to last week's episode, we talked about how we're trying to close out the year. Mm -hmm. And so we are like mass recording content right Mm -hmm. now. And so this is episode three that we've recorded today. Yes. Okay. And we love it. That's right. And then you're going to go record two episodes for your other show. I have two other episodes that to record today. We had a goal of four. We're going to fall short. We're going to fall short. But I had a meeting, right? So I had to go to a meeting. But I was going to blame my mother, but it's okay. Okay. You can blame your mom. That's fine. Um, I love you, mom. Um, so the thing is, though, is that, you know, like I could, I work with clients one-on-one you know, I I have a CPA firm. I do consulting, but I can record an episode of a podcast and put it out there, mm-hmm. and help hundreds, thousands of people. Mm-hmm. You know, if I teach in a classroom, I teach maybe twenty five people. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so let's say, you know, I teach eight classes a, or I teach mm-hmm. six classes a year. That's 150 people. And if it's truly evergreen, it can help people for who knows how long they'll be able to access this information online. Mm-hmm. You know, but like accounting and focus is going to help a million people this mm-hmm. year. So it's like, you know, I think we need to have some perspective, Yeah. you know, that I'm, you know, I want people to follow this podcast who are looking for community who keep coming back and listening over and over again, you know, join HQ, you know, become a member of that awesome community mm-hmm. and, and interact with us. Right. Yeah. And allow us to help them grow their businesses. Like that's really what I'm looking mm-hmm. for. And I don't look at it and go, well, we don't have 10 million, you know, podcast mm-hmm. listeners. Yeah. Or we're not even as big care. as, we're definitely not as big as, uh, as a kind of focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. But, you know, I think we get so caught up in all the vanity metrics mm-hmm. that we don't really have any idea of how how much we want to build our audience. So, like, to what size? Mm-hmm. And, the you know, the reason I think that this is interesting is that I'm seeing a lot of Facebook groups get shut down mm-hmm. because they're getting too big. Mm-hmm. They're getting unwieldy. And... So it's like, it's kind of funny because, you know, people will be like, oh, you got to build this massive audience, build this massive audience. Mm-hmm. But people are finding they're getting too big yeah. and they can't, you know, and they're, they're having trouble keeping up with them. So I think when you start thinking about building an audience, there has to be an end game. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't just say, I, you know, I want to have a gazillion followers. Mm-hmm. What's the end game for that? Yeah. How does that turn into revenue that helps your business? You know, you know, really, this kind of discussion goes well for if you're a blogger, a YouTuber, a podcaster, or you develop content of some form. Um, you know, and, and we're really talking about long-term audience. Um, you can spend a lot of money and probably generate audience quickly. Whether or not you'll retain them is different, but we're not talking about buying commercials for your podcast on, on a PlayStation View. What we're talking Which about... I thought was so weird. Yes. Um, what we're talking about is doing this stuff for the long term, um, if if you decide if this is a hobby for you, don't worry about the audience at all. Mm-hmm. You know, just do it because it's fun. Put it because you love doing the content. Put it up there. If you have a group where you can talk about it, it's fine. D- but don't worry about building a community, building an audience. Mm-hmm. But if this is something that you're using, especially as a tool of a business, um, as a way to bring in money to your family, which is hi, we're done our avatar here, so that's probably why you're here listening. Uh, is because you're using these kind of things as tools. You need to think long term mm. and understand that long term followers, uh, especially rabid fans, are always your ultimate goal. You know, you can make a lot of money with a list of only a thousand people if those thousand people are behind you and really support you and feel the value that you give them. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and this is, I see a lot of like brick and mortar clients that say, I don't need an audience. What do I need an audience for? Because well, you you're think st- it's like 1996. <laughs> but the thing is, it's like you're still trying to get butts in seats or butts mm-hmm. in store, or you know, mm-hmm. every brick and mortar that I talk to needs an audience. Mm-hmm. Because you know, I think Brendan Bursard said, you know, he's like, it's great because like I can send out an email with an offer and it's like printing money, mm-hmm. right? And think about this: how cool would it be for your brick and mortar to say? wow, we just got in this new product, come get it. Mm -hmm. Or we've got openings this week, come book an appointment Mm -hmm. and fill those slots or sell that product. You know, you get that last minute, like someone who's going to come in in two hours, like to sit in your barber chair, we'll say, and they cancel, you're screwed. Well, you know, that let's say you make $100 a haircut, that's just $100 that you lost there. Hey, spend like, 10 bucks and throw up some ads on Facebook that are very targeted saying, Hey, here's a $5 coupon. If you come down now, you spent 15 bucks. If you can fill that one seat with the 15 bucks, you just made your day. Right. Or email your list Mm -hmm. and say, Hey, I know it's really hard to get in, but I've got an opening Mm -hmm. this afternoon. If you want that slot, you know, give us a call right now. And if you need a client in a chair and you don't have those chairs filled, you're not making money for those times. Exactly. So, you know, this isn't just for online businesses. This is your brick and mortar. Mm-hmm. These are, you know, I mean. 
If you go back to our episode on future trending, there's going to be a blurring of the lines of what's online and what's brick and mortar. Those things are going to blur more over the next 10 years. Right. And I would make the argument that all brick and mortar businesses are online businesses. Yeah. They have to be Mm. if they're going to survive. Otherwise, they're going to be victims of the retail ice age. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Or, or hope they live in a community that's so small, you know, like you live out in rural Alaska where they don't have good, reliable internet. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Okay. So, you know, the first step to building an audience is that you have to put out quality content. This is the first thing we're putting out there because no matter what you do, mm-hmm. n- none of these other things will help you build an audience over the long term. That is a rabid fan or even a mediocre fan if your quality of your content is no good. You know, if you're busting your butt trying to, you know, be the next Johnny Dumas and you're making, you know, a podcast episode a day and you can't really edit them and there's no show notes for them and you can't get anything else done for the to help grow that, you're wasting your time. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's, you know, when we talk about quality content, we're not we're not saying that you need to have thousands of dollars of production equipment. We're not saying that you need to have, you know, a $5,000 camera. We don't. We don't. Mm -hmm. You have to have content that is consistent, that resonates with your avatar, Mm -hmm. that delivers value for them. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we get stuck in this rut where we have to develop content and so we put crap out there to say that we've put something out mm-hmm. there. And I'm sorry, but like people are too smart for that. Yes. Have faith in your avatar. They're smarter than you think. Right. And so, you know, t- this stat I think is unbelievable. Yeah. And no, I found this uh, great infograph on HubSpot and I'll put it up. It links to some actually really good resources that we used to build this episode as well. But here's a stat they found from Time Magazine. They did uh, research on 2 billion page views generated by 580,000 articles on 2,000 sites. And I don't know what the sites were, but I'm sure some of them were really high in sites and some of them probably weren't as high mm-hmm. in sites. And, and this group Chartbeat went through and analyzed the data and they found that 55% of the readers... These are on the web pages, spent fewer than 15 seconds. Now, that's not including landing pages. That's not not about opt-in pages. This is about articles on sites. And you figure, I mean, if you're talking about 580,000 articles on 2,000 sites, you're talking about sites that have some serious content. And I thought about this at first because, you know, a lot of the new SEO is about having uh, quantity of words on a page quantity and quality of words on a page to get a good SEO ranking for a specific page and like 1200 plus words. And I was like, that's crazy. And then like, as I'm doing more research, I'm going to other articles. I went to the time magazine article that this is referencing. Um, and I, I clicked through and I scrolled down in about two seconds. I saw a headline, which told me this is the spot you should look in Jeffrey. I looked in that spot, got what I was looking for and was Leaving, I was going, oh, Mm -hmm. I do that too. I do that a lot, Mm -hmm. especially when I'm researching it. If I'm looking for something specific, I'm scanning through, looking for some headlines that make sense to me. And that's also the way they say SEO works. I wonder if there's a connection. Right. Well, and it's, you know, and it's interesting because if I get to an article, you know, and again, talking about quality that doesn't have, you know, that doesn't have a graphic that doesn't have good headlines. And I'm not just talking about like the headline on top. I'm talking about the subheadings, the subheadings, H twos. You know, if I can't quickly scan and find what I'm looking for, I'm going to hop off your page even faster than that. Yeah. Cause I would get to the bottom and say, wait, I couldn't find it. This page doesn't have what I'm looking for. And I'm heading back anyway. Right. And the irony being that stat does not say people aren't getting value from those pages. Mm hmm. I've tested it out and I can get to the value on a long form post in 15 seconds. Well, and it's interesting because one of the things that we look at with accounting and focus is we look at the bounce rate because Mm -hmm. we do get a ton of traffic. 
And it's typically high schools or college students mm-hmm. that are looking for like the answer to a question, right? They don't understand a concept. They don't understand mm-hmm. something. So they're looking for it online. And so what we found is that typically our view, you know, the, the time on site is pretty short, mm-hmm. but our bounce rate is pretty low. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of interesting because if, if you don't know what bounce rate is, bounce rate is going back to the search engine, mm-hmm. right? So if they, like, if they find you via search and they go back. It's essentially, it's an exit, I believe, within like three seconds. I'm not sure on the exact term on that, but it's a very quick. Usually it's. It doesn't have to be, though. It doesn't have to be. It's typically the way they consider it is the length of time to hit the back button. Right. But, but typically, if you're hitting back, that means what that tells Google is that the answer that I was looking for probably wasn't there. And you want to know something interesting? Their final research is showing that's not true, too. Well, see, that's interesting. But the thing that we found, though, is that our bounce rate is mm-hmm. low because what people can do is they can go on to accounting and focus, find the answer to their question quickly, and go on. Yeah. But what they're finding is, too, sometimes on pages, even when you have the long form content, if you're stuffing the answer in that first paragraph to try and lure people into the page, they get to the page, they see the answer, and they bounce. And they go, yeah. So they can actually still drive value in a bounce they're finding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting how like search engines and everything are changing mm-hmm. because they didn't understand how people consumed web content Which before. is also why they change so much. Right. Okay, so that's like we talked a lot about blog content mm-hmm. and websites and stuff like that. You know, with podcasts and YouTube, I think it's a little bit different, Mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, the, the quality content, I'll I'll tell you, go to a video for accounting and focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am not getting points for, you know, for the look of the videos. No. Um, I'm using a black background. I'm writing in bright colors on, um, on electronic board. My handwriting is not that great. Mm -hmm but my explanations are really good. The things you have to remember too is the most important thing in video or audio, either or, the the stranger one to people is video, is the audio quality. Mm -hmm. It can't, it doesn't need to be perfection. And actually a lot of professional editors say don't get rid of the ums, don't get rid of the thinking words, don't uh, hide every breath between words. You leave those in, but the the clarity of the audio needs to be good. That's more important than even the video on YouTube. Right, and that is one thing that we have invested some money in, and not a tremendous amount of money. I think our entire setup for the podcast was maybe 300 bucks, mm-hmm. but we don't just use it for the podcast. If I'm doing Facebook Lives, mm-hmm. typically I will come up here and I will run my sound through our soundboard mm-hmm. and use plus the Plus you look mics. cooler with a microphone. And plus you look cooler. Um, when I do video now for accounting and focus or for my classes, I'll actually come here and I will run the sound through the soundboard because Mm -hmm. it sounds better. Yeah. So, you know, I think that is one thing like Mm -hmm. that equipment can help you with a little bit. And I, I have heard, and Jeff Walker pushes this and I agree to a point, uh, headsets can do just as good and it depends on the person. There's a little bit more to it than that, but inexpensive like USB headsets can have really good mic quality, good enough quality. Mm-hmm. Cause you also have to remember too, coming streaming over the internet, there's a sort of a maximum quality level you can achieve anyway. Right. It's not like you're creating a CD that gets shipped out to people. Right. But that's the thing. So, but you know, in all of these mediums, it's about the value that you're delivering. So you can have an amazing set, an amazing sound, and if you're not delivering something that's worth watching mm-hmm. or listening to, mm-hmm. you're not going to build an audience. And the other trick is too to, you know, especially the longer form your video or audio is, the more you need to keep people going. You know, there's something else coming down the road. We're going to get to click through rates. Don't worry, people. There will be click through rates later on in this episode. <laughs> but so, but think about it. Like, have you ever been to? like a high budget action movie mm-hmm. and it like, it looked good and the actors looked good and everything looked good and had big explosions. And you're like, there's no story. Mm-hmm. Like there's no, there's nothing that ties all the explosions together. This is no water world. Wrong show. <laughs> but yeah, but that's the thing, <laughs> you know? So it's like, yeah, it looks great, but, it was boring. Mm-hmm. 
right? And that's kind of the thing is that you need to provide content Mm -hmm. where the content is actually good. So the avatar is important. You know, what's good to one person is not good to someone else. There is a subjectivity to quality content. Mm. And you need to be nailing it for not you, not for an academic or a peer, but for your avatar. Right. Yep. So, you know, the other thing is like you... (sighs) Showing emotion is really important. You know, I think it's one of those things that, you know, like if you listen to last week's episode, I was kind of hyper in last mm-hmm. week's episode. Um, and it was because I had just come back from school and I had my energy levels were good, you know, and those are the kind of things that like people will notice that. Like if you're very monotone mm. and you're boring and everything sounds like this, People are gonna like they're, they're gonna catch up with that, and you're probably gonna put people to sleep. Well, it's funny, like like as an actor, it's one of the things you talk about with other actors are, are ways to modulate your voice to bring out emotion, which is kind of funny. A lot of the tactics don't work well on radio or an audio form because, you know, part of it is typically when I modulate, I do a lot of volume movement too, which is completely stupid in audio because I the mic's right here. Mm-hmm. You know, I just need the, the tones to go up and down. I don't need to increase or decrease volume. And then I have to go through and I have to level it all off. So it really, really just creates more work. <laughs> but, um, you know, but that's important because people associate certain sounds and rhythms with, which is why sometimes if you don't have a great voice, um, there is some truth that, you know, you need help to either make it better and maybe you will never be a high-end voice personality, but maybe you can get to a point where it's good enough for your audience. Or sometimes maybe you're not going to be able to use audio. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is you got to kind of know your strengths. And one final thing to think about, too, with the quality of the content is actionable steps people can take. You know, it's great to deliver them important theoretical information, but most people ultimately want some form of action. And this is something that actually I'm not great at on either show. Um, Better a little bit maybe on the other show, but, you know, have – an action that they can do with the content that you're delivering, not the call to action to, you know, go click on the thing to buy something from you, but act some actionable step that they can apply to improve themselves, which is why they're interacting with you anyway. Right. And that's the thing is like you, the best content has a takeaway, right? And so if you're having trouble with your content and you're having trouble building an audience, um, And actually, like, Brendan Burchard was really big on this. He's like, when you're writing out, like, you know, you're going to do a speech or you're Mm going to do a podcast or a video, what are the takeaways? And, like, write them all down, you know, so that way you make sure that they get addressed. They get that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that's really important. So that quality content, you know, deliver value, whatever means you want to use. You know, and think about that, like, in your email list, too. Like, don't just, like, you know, don't punt when you're writing email, you know, make sure that something that there's, you know, sometimes we just write emails to remind people that a new podcast episode Mm -hmm. is coming out. But in those emails, you know, we try to keep those pretty, there's two different ways we do them. They're either really short saying, Hey, this is why you need to go check out this week's episode because this is the value we're Mm going to deliver if you listen. Or sometimes we'll actually deliver value in the email Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes like additional stuff that we didn't talk about in the podcast or, you know, there's something to take away. So kind of keep, it's okay to send out emails to remind people that something is out there, you know, but don't make them, don't make them really long Hmm. unless you're going to include more value in that email. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about traffic. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. So you, and (laughs) You know, I think we kind of covered some of this stuff in the launch episode. You know, we're like, well, I'm just going to post this podcast or this blog mm-hmm. and everybody's going to come. Mm-hmm. Yay. Um, I mean, so I'll tell you, yes, sometimes that happens. Like with Accounting and Focus, I wrote that really unintentionally for SEO purposes. It was written really well. Mm-hmm. And we kind of found that out after the fact. Mm-hmm. It's very rare that you are going to write a and you figure accounting and focus launched in 2014. It's 2017 and we have a million people a year that go to that mm-hmm. site. 
the likelihood that you are organically going to get a site to that point that people are just going to find it is really rare. It was kind of a fluke with a county in focus. Well, and I'll talk a little bit as we go through here about why why it worked and what the fluke was. It was a lot more to do than the content on the page. But uh, b- before we go in, you know, there's three types of traffic we want to talk about here. There's paid traffic. That's pretty obvious. You pay people to have traffic put, pointed towards your site. Um, there's earned traffic. I don't mean it's because your content's great and people just, I have to go back and read uh, Jeff's new blog post today. It's just that good. No, that's not earned. Earned is SEO. Yep. Earned is if they're searching for something that your site delivers, you come up and they click on your your link. And there's borrowed. Borrowed's the reason why we talk about platforms. Mm-hmm. It's social media. It's Facebook. Yay, my Facebook page has a million likes and they just changed the algorithm. It's YouTube. It's YouTube. YouTube's a great way to hack that. Well, it's a great way to hack it, but it's also, once again, it's still borrowed traffic. Right, you know, exactly. If they change the way they do it or they view it in SEO, that will crush your tactic, your strategy. Yep. So any traffic that you get on any platform, including traffic organically reaching your website, it's in a way all borrowed. Mm-hmm. Even if you've earned it, it's still kind of borrowed because SEO could change. People have lost businesses because of SEO changes. Yep. So... Keep in mind that ultimately you need to get to a platform in which you have 100% control over, and the best one is still email. Yeah. Okay. So let's start talking about these. And, you know, we're going to kind of go through different, um, different avenues. So, you know, I'm a big believer that you, if you're really trying to build an audience, you need to have some degree of paid traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't have to be all the time. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you that even when we were building accounting and focus, I like towards the end of the semester when people were struggling with finals, mm-hmm. we would run ads mm-hmm. for accounting and focus. Um, and we would see the traffic would go up. You know, the thing with that site is you're not getting a lot of repeat customers, but the goal is to help people so that they refer other people to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of one of our strategies for that. You can have Google ads, you can have Facebook ads. Again, it's knowing who your avatar mm-hmm. is and knowing like, okay, if like with accounting and focus, you know, if how would a college student figure out to go to that website, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of times it's through Google, mm-hmm. right? Cause they're searching for something. Um, sometimes it's okay. I'm taking a break while I'm studying. Oh wait, there's this website that I could go to yeah. cause they saw a Facebook ad. So you got, again, it's really important to understand who your avatar is. Yeah, and we want the paid one to come up in Google, not in Facebook, because they're probably not looking for us on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of you are like, what about Instagram? That's Facebook. Yeah. Um, but uh, the great thing is these are low-cost entry points. Google has wonderful tools to help you do keyword research, especially for what you know, people like to call uh, either short or long-trail uh, uh, keywords, which are essentially uh, the longer or the less you use the phrase is, um, it becomes what they call a long trail. And those are the keywords that are typically a lot easier mm-hmm. <laughs> to score well at SEO. So sure, you're not getting 200 million people looking at it, but uh, you compete much better against the two, the 10,000 who are looking for this uh, long trail keyword. So right. it's just a different kind of way. Great SEO is why uh, the county focus took off. And it, the pages were written good, which helps. Um, we happen to use H2 uh, headlines, which helps because that's what Google looks for inside of posts as like major headings. Um, and they were focused on topics. Um, and then there were a lot of subtopics, which is like just what Google's looking for in a page. The reason it works and the reason the strategy worked for a county of focus is because of who got it and where they shared it. Mm-hmm. because the shares would be to EDU websites. And we get link backs from EDU websites, which is what they call a high-value a high value target, essentially. Outside of government sites, EDU sites are the next most important to get links from. If you can get links from those kinds of sites to your site, you will generate, it still takes time, but you will generate good SEO traffic. Right, and that's one thing. So what we kind of did in... It, for accounting and focus, it's a little bit more complicated than that because what we found was that a lot of universities were actually using our videos on YouTube 
like as course material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that gave our YouTube channel more credibility. It got brought up a lot as a suggested uh, resource. Mm -hmm. So it gets a lot of suggested views. You know, we look back, I can look at the Mm -hmm. back end of YouTube and I see all the universities that are using it. So that's one thing that really helped. Then what we did is we said, okay, since we have really good credibility with YouTube. Mm-hmm. We made sure that every single video had a link back to the website in its description. I think that one simple move, like tripled the traffic. Our tra- early in the I, days. I think our traffic at the time, and it would always do this. It would kind of get up to a new high. It would stay for a little while, and then the next year it would kind of go up another notch. But this one it was like mid year. I think we're probably around five thousand views. A day, and it went up to like ten thousand. Five thousand views a month. A month. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah a day would be even better. Um, but that's almost where we are right now. Yeah, we're close to that. But you know, it it it, it doubled our traffic mm-hmm. literally within two months. It, we just saw like this, you know, graph wise, it looked awesome. You're like, yes. No, we went from that site went from five thousand to twenty five thousand very quickly, mm-hmm. and then it went from twenty five thousand to fifty thousand very mm-hmm. quickly. Um, and a lot of that was the link backs, mm-hmm. you know, so because that's the thing. If if you can build one of the reasons I love YouTube is because if you can build a strong YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's why, like, our, all of our podcast episodes are up on YouTube. Mm-hmm. OK, Even though we don't push them. Right. We don't really push them, but they're there because Google owns YouTube. Mm-hmm. OK. That's why if you try to link a YouTube video to Facebook, it looks terrible. Mm-hmm. Because Facebook doesn't like YouTube. They mm-hmm. want you to put your video native on their platform. But Google really likes YouTube. Mm-hmm. So if you have EDUs that are linking to your, you know, to your YouTube channel, mm-hmm. then Google says, wow, that's really good. You know, universities think this is a good mm-hmm. channel. And then you link a website to those YouTube videos. Google is going to say, well, wow, that has a lot. We think it has mm-hmm. a lot of credibility because we like YouTube. And so we're going to give your site a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. And then because of the SEO and the search results, it just kind of fed itself. Yeah. But really, truthfully, the EDU links are so much more valuable than even the YouTube links. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and the thing is, if you are looking for to to get to an SEO strategy, you need to be going to places like uh, entrepreneur centers. Uh, A lot of those are sometimes even associated with local universities Mm -hmm. uh, or local governments. And, and, even if you don't take pay, get links to your website, especially to content that you're trying to compete on for keywords. Yep. Because that will add a lot of credibility in the eyes of places like Google. And it becomes a depreciation in return. Like we have a lot more EDU links today than we first started getting them. But when we first started getting them, our traffic went up a lot faster. And so they're still really good to have. Don't get us wrong. But uh, link for link, they're not as valuable the more you get. Right. And so here's the thing, like, you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, but you're a college professor. It's easy to get, you know, at least an EDU link on your university. Okay. If you want to become a speaker, right, one of the best things that you can do is whatever, like whatever degree program Mm -hmm. would sync the most with what you're doing, find out if they've got a club. Mm -hmm. and offer to speak at their club. Because typically what they do, if you're a speaker, even if it's for a club, Mm -hmm. they will put that in their their university calendar Mm -hmm. with your bio and a link to your website. Mm -hmm. You now have an EDU link. Mm -hmm. And if you do that to all all sorts of universities, now you have a whole bunch of EDU links. So this is not something that has to be really difficult. And and, and the thing is, definitely these clubs are looking for speakers. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. And they love when, you know, especially like when business people come in Mm -hmm. and speak, um, it's, it's a great opportunity Mm -hmm. for them. Um, still the most consistent way to get attention. And remember that whatever strategies you're doing Mm -hmm. should end up at your newsletter sign up Mm -hmm. or your email sign up. And, And the simple fact is, you know, the SEO rules might change. So maybe your traffic depreciates a lot. If you have a good, as I like to call it, well-groomed newsletter, um, that will keep a consistent return on investment for your business, something that you can plan off of. 
Mm-hmm. You know, because Facebook might change the way groups work again. Facebook might change the way pages work again. If history is any indicator, they're going to keep doing it. So understand that you need to have a newsletter because it's a good way to communicate with them. Mm-hmm. And you can maybe get them back to your website through the newsletter. Right. And, you know, you can, you know, you want to have some sort of opt in to drive people, something that you're doing of value. Do not just have a list to sell to them. Because your list won't stay around for very long. So once again, it's the great content on the channels you're working with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can also use other platforms, mm-hmm. social media. Um, I love speaking. I think it's a great way mm-hmm. to get new fans. Do interviews, do mm-hmm. Facebook Lives, do reviews. You know, Think about different ways that you can get yourself and your website out there. Yeah, you know, m- most definitely. But remember, the rules are always changing on those. Don't make a business model around, uh, especially social media or being on other people's shows. You know, the goal is to always get them back to your newsletter. Mm-hmm. Always, always, always. And if you don't have a newsletter, it's your email list, yeah. right? That's the goal. Um, okay, so it's funny because we, you know, I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago. You need to optimize your old content. Mm-hmm. You need to make sure that you're constantly sharing your old content. And one of the best ways, <coughs> one of the best ways that you can do this is use something like mm-hmm. Recur Post. Yep. Um, so Recur Post, we used to talk a lot about Edgar. I like Edgar. Recur Post, I think you get a lot more for your mm-hmm. money. And they actually have packages that start at a much lower mm-hmm. price point. The purpose of having, you know, I know a lot of people are using Buffer, they're using Hootsuite, they're using something like that. The benefit to something like Recur Post is that you load all of your content into it Mm -hmm. and it just keeps sharing it out. So with Hootsuite or Buffer, you've constantly got to reload stuff Mm -hmm. in and tell it to reshare it again. With Recur Post, you don't do that. Here's a pro tip. If um, you're optimizing old content, one of the things people will try and do is they'll try and smash... Uh, maybe some keywords into URLs because that's one of the suggestions that you'll typically get from it, things like SEO Yoast. Remember, if you do that and you have these things shared out on social media, you're creating a broken link back to your website. And there's simple things, uh, a, a quick plugin like um, uh, Pretty Link, which there's a free version of. You can actually take the old URL, put it in there, and just have it point to the new URL. That way, you don't lose all of the social media posts you have out there that are pointing back to your website if you decide to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't get super stressed out on, on checking off every box. You know, like I don't always need to have, you know, the keywords in the URL. I don't always need to have, you know, world building. And I struggle with this sometimes because I really, I've been stuck in that mindset where I think fantasy world, this, mm-hmm. th- those don't really do anything for you. Um, but, you know, Occasionally, if that's the context of the the actual uh, piece of content, yeah, do that kind of stuff. But if you change it later on, make sure to keep a reference to it so the older links aren't broken. But, you know, it's like one thing we did, you know, when we moved the content for account, uh, for Small Biz Life, we moved it off of WordPress and we put it in Kajabi. Mm-hmm. I did new graphics for every single episode that mm-hmm. we had. And... You know, I think I was we were much better at doing graphics at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and we just took the time, like I just got in this mode where I was doing graphics. That's one way to kind of, you know, liven up mm-hmm. old content. Another thing is like, make sure that you've got headings in there. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And it's like, you can kind of decide like, okay, these are five posts that I wish did better. Mm-hmm. I'm going to update these five posts. Mm-hmm. And just see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, see if you get more traction from them. Um, but remember, especially in SEO terms, you're, you're thinking in quarters to see mm-hmm. a, a real difference. You can't look at the week to week, you know, because I changed it last week and I'm getting the same views this week and expect there to be any difference. Right. In about a quarter, you kind of go back to see, is there a change at that point? Yep, exactly. Um, you want to make sure that you've got um, reference links. Yeah. And those are the internal links that you hear about. It, it, you know, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, cornerstone content, content that is fighting for those more competitive keywords that you wish you had. Uh, when you talk about those types of subjects within other content, make sure to link back internally on your website to that older content 
that helps tell Google that those are more important when it comes to those keywords. Helps mm-hmm. raise it in the search rankings. Right. All right. Now, so, you know, some of, you know, one of the things you can do that, you know, is a great way to build an audience is use other people's platforms, mm-hmm. right? Be a guest poster. And the smaller you are, the more truth there is in this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I know Jeff mentioned John Lee Dumas. Like, if you are on EO Fire, you are going to grow your audience almost instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, I know people who have been on that show, and it is great for your audience. Um, getting noticed by someone who is bigger than you and having them mention your name mm-hmm. is really amazing for your yeah. business. So, you know, anything... That, and the thing is... Okay. We get pitched a lot for people to be on this show, mm-hmm. um, which I think is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I also get pitched a lot for accounting and focus. People want their mm-hmm. links on my site. Or they want to do guest posts on our podcast website. Yeah. Payment Free Life actually gets a lot of people mm-hmm. that ask if they can write for that. Um, if you are going to pitch, make sure that you've done your homework. Mm. Um, I had somebody that pitched us that actually wrote a review on iTunes um, and send us a link to it. Both clever actions. V- very clever. And the review said something to the effect of, I think Kristen and Jerry are wonderful. Mm-hmm. At doing interviews. At doing interviews. At the point, I don't think we had released any interviews. I think we had one. Okay. We had one. Um, but I did have, I have had people who pitched the show before we had any interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, make sure that like, you really understand what it is they do. And Some, and the problem is I get a lot of pitches where people never explain the value that they could bring to our audience. And the other trick is some sites make their livelihood off of getting content from guests. And they're very good at, at building the SEO and doing all of that, that side of things. But maybe they're not great at writing the content, but they have a great site. And so... Most of those sites are easier to get onto, and they typically have it well laid out, like like submitting an article to a magazine on this is what you need to do to get a guest post on ours. Well, like the big one, you know, the big thing right now is writing for Medium. Medium is a very popular website. That's replaced uh, uh, HuffPo. HuffPo? Right. Yeah, because HuffPost kind of tightened things down a little bit. Okay. It's much harder to get on Huffington Post. Um, Medium... You can post, it's almost like having a blog that's integrated into their website, kind of like Huffington Post used to be. Um, but most people don't realize that it is incredibly easy to start writing for Medium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, so people kind of give that a lot of credence, and I'm mm-hmm. seeing a lot of people share out Medium but, articles. And, well, because, but the thing is, too, because they get a lot of traffic, um, you know, it, that site will probably have a better page ranking than yours. Mm-hmm. You, you do work for them. It's going to help the SEO for your site. And, you know, typically it's usually either in the, the bio of, of the article or maybe there are, in, are links to other posts of yours in that article. Mm-hmm. Yep. You can also try something like help a reporter out. Mm-hmm. Um, the I find people who get frustrated with Haro um, is that they are pitching articles to people what I do is I look at articles that, you know, I'm looking for things that people are already writing yes. in the daily emails. Yeah. The easier thing to do in there is, and it's, it still could be difficult for you, especially until you've done it a few times, um, you know, and, you know, follow the Nick Pavlidis advice, hunt the people down and try and build relationships with them. If that's what you really want to do, it's probably a better strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you're trying to pitch how you can help make their product, their article better. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, when we think of launching, we typically think of products, but your content needs to be dealt with the same way. You're not going to have the same kind of budget or the same, uh, time effort put into it, but there should be a process as you get ready, you tease out what's coming up for content. And as you go away, do you still have that newer content more prevalent than other things that you're sharing out? Have a plan on how you launch your content. Yeah, and you actually did a really good job with this. I think with with your other site, and we started to do this with accounting and or with uh, small biz life, mm-hmm. where you have five images, mm-hmm. and one goes out every single day. Mm-hmm. You know, for the first five days yeah. that an episode launches. And as we get better, there will be original like write up stuff 
to go in. Right now, I pretty much just use a tweet uh, that I share out on all platforms, but uh, that's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not about being perfect. It's about leveling up your game and doing something better yeah, every and, day. And here's one thing, because I was thinking about this today, because um, we have a... I try to do a thread once a week in the small biz life community where I let Mm -hmm. people, you know, I want to know like what value are you sharing out? Right. Mm -hmm. Cause this is a really big thing that we, you know, that we try to promote. And I noticed that a lot of people when they're sharing during in social media, especially Mm -hmm. on posts like this, they just share a link. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to hype up their content. They're not talking up their content. They're not even saying what their content is. Mm -hmm. All they do is share a link mm-hmm. and hope to God that something that's going to entice somebody pulls through. Mm-hmm. Or maybe there's link. a decent image and a link and that's it. Right. But that's, you know, when you're sharing your content out, you're trying to sell people, mm-hmm. right? You're trying to sell them to click on it and read it or click on it and consume it. And I typically, when I rely on one thing, it's typically the headline. We're hoping when we put headlines together that that will compel people through a search uh, uh engine result or through a link to go, Oh, I want to read this article because of that name is appealing to me. Mm -hmm. But like a lot of times, you know, when I'm sharing in other people's groups, when they have that day, Mm -hmm. right. And you know, you're not putting out your own post, so it's not coming through like it would if it were a post, Mm -hmm. it's just a comment, right? So the picture is going to be funky. The headline might come through. You're not going to get all the description that you normally would. Like I write up a little blurb Mm -hmm. about, the link before I put the link in. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thoughtful about that and I do it, and if I do it in the first group of the week and I think it's pretty good, I'm going to save that little blurb Mm -hmm. so I can share it in the other groups on the other days that we're allowed to do that. I notice that we get more traffic. Mm -hmm. We get more downloads when I do that. And here's another pro tip. If you belong to 500 groups and you spend one day and take the same blurb and go to every group. Oh, please don't do that. Um, the people who are in multiple groups with you will notice that. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, and I have, I have a list of groups that have a day that you can promote mm-hmm. your content in a particular thread. Mm-hmm. And so Monday I go to one group, Tuesday I go to another group. And I basically have one five days a week, mm-hmm. um, where I can do that. You know, don't just leave the link. Mm-hmm promote it, right? Promote yourself. You know, I always start with this week on the small biz life podcast. It's short copy Mm -hmm. with the end goal of selling them a click through. Right. Exactly. You're trying to sell the click through. Okay. Um, and then, you know, find people to partner with, Mm -hmm. you know, and you want somebody that you share their content and they share your content. Mm -hmm. And if you have something like recur post, you can actually create an RSS feed of their content Mm -hmm. And, you know, from their mm-hmm. blog and pull it in. That's actually a strategy. It's one of the things I do for the people I've interviewed on, on the other show. And maybe we'll start doing it on Small Biz Life too, where I actually have one time a day, I share out links from people who I've interviewed. Mm-hmm. And I think that's awesome, you know, because it helps them, you know. And then the nice thing is that I think people see the value that you provide when they're, when you, you know, when they get to be on your show. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you ask people, I think they're typically more willing to say yes, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's the other thing too is, you know, it's not just being a guest on other people's things, but trying to get people, especially if you have a YouTube channel or a podcast, trying to get people to be on your thing Mm -hmm. because, you know, hopefully they'll share it out with their audience as well and bring their audience in to listen. And the key is you want to make it simple for them, you know, and it's like when I have the time and I'm doing this right, I'm sending out at least the link and the article and when it's going live. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think it's easier to do the further ahead you get in Mm -hmm. the process. Um, But yeah, so, you know, look for partners, look for people that you can, you know, who have similar, you know, similar avatars that you, than you have Mm -hmm. and see if you can, Hey, you know, I'd love to share your content with our audience and do it for them first. Mm -hmm. And then if they kind of see there's some traction to say, hey, how's, are you noticing, you know, does it seem like people are kind of clicking through? Mm -hmm. Um, And then ask them, would you mind sharing this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that's a really good way to do that. Um, Okay. So please, please, please stop with the clickbait. You know, this idea that, you know, and we do talk about the importance of convert conversion and, and CTR, your click through rates. 
Uh, those are important. But when we say clickbait, we mean something very specific, which is not a compelling headline. It's a compelling deceptive headline, which goes, oh, I want to see what happened to him after all of these years that I clicked through. And maybe there's a picture, but it's with a bunch of other unrelated stuff and people, it's annoying. You'll get reported a lot, um, especially like through social media for it, it not being good. Um, whether or not you get caught is different. I don't know, but you know, over, you might get short-term benefits through those kind of tactics, but on the long term, you're not going to be able to s- sustain a business plan with clickbait. Right. And and Google is starting to get very aware of the sites that use clickbait on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, and if they haven't already done so, it's just a matter of time before Google starts shutting down their organic traffic. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be really careful. Um, you know, if you want to improve conversions, you know, it's a lot about testing it's a lot about like hacking your SEO, making you know, yeah, sure do that do research on what good headlines are mm-hmm. because you still want a compelling headline. It just needs to be consistent with what they get when they click through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, if you don't have SEO Yoast on your WordPress site, you need to download that like yesterday. If you are a Thrive Themes user, they have a great headline optimizer mm-hmm. where you can actually add, add in multiple headlines and it will do all of the funky statistical math stuff to say when it relevantly knows which one's better. And then it will automatically disregard the other ones. Yeah. Thrive themes is seriously like, I know a lot of people are using Genesis, you know, they're using DV like thrive themes is one of the Mm. best values out there for Mm. building a website because the stuff that you get like built Especially into Especially a themes. marketing first website where the plan mm-hmm. is ultimately to drive people to an action it is by far the best one I've seen for WordPress. Lead pages, built in opt ins, you know, you can do quizzes with it. You can do um, whole courses in it now. Yeah, you can do courses in it now. Like it is it's incredible. Put Woo a link. Commerce. There'll be a link in here. Okay. There's also like a WooCommerce. Uh, their themes are WooCommerce compliant. Yep. Which means that you can use uh, Thrive themes to change WooCommerce and it's all one beautiful site and you don't have to pay a developer to get it to match your other theme and then you're spending more money. And it's like all drag and drop, which is so cool because mm-hmm. I remember we first started building in WordPress and it was just like, oh, it was awful. Because if this you're a small shop, you, you're not going to, you might spend some money up front if you're smart to get your overall design built. But then from that point on, when you need a new, you know, a new opt-in page, you need a new lead magnet page or a new sale, you can't afford forward necessarily to always uh, farm that out. So you want a system that's easy for you to update. Yeah. And, and thrive themes is awesome for that. Um, you know, one of the best ways to get, you know, kind of click throughs and kind of get on the radar. And I don't know that we didn't put this tip in there. Um, if you want Google to find your page more quickly, post a link to Google plus, Mm -hmm. That is the only reason that we have Google Plus accounts mm-hmm. is because Google Plus, if you post content there that is brand new, it will get indexed faster into the search engine because Google will go. Faster, and it also has the same page rank benefits as YouTube. Yep. So you want to make sure that you do that. But, you know, one thing is like you're trying to get traffic to your posts, mm-hmm. right, when they come out. Your email list is a great way to do that. Mm-hmm. Let your email list know, hey, guys, hi, there's a new post. Yep. Um, because then you're driving some traffic to it, right? Yeah. And so you're kind of creating some SEO buzz, mm-hmm. you know, for your post. You know, the other thing you keep in mind too is hacking. If you're posting content or have stuff like in Amazon or you're, you're submitting a thing, understand in general how it works and try and beat the system. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like if you're putting a new podcast together, if you can get like 20 reviews a week, 20 reviews a week. Your the first job. week. Just the first week. Well, especially the first week. You have to have 20 the first week and try and get 20 every week. People, you're trying to sell them to do that one thing for you. Mm-hmm. You're begging them. You're, you're, you're doing whatever it takes. If you don't have a big power marketing machine, it's you just maybe begging people. Who knows? Yep. If you can do that, you can hack. Get a new and noteworthy if you have a good um, um, icon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll get a new and noteworthy and you'll get so much more traffic that you, you couldn't have gotten when you start off anywhere else. And it's, you know, it's funny that you talk about hacking because, you know, w- one of the most successful hacks that we had for this podcast and 
it, it's funny because we try out different things and see how they work. And, you know, we, and I don't, we got, I don't remember where it was from another podcaster mm. and they said, ask people to introduce your podcast to somebody else. And if they don't know how to listen to podcasts, show them. We did that pretty consistently for a couple months. I did that very consistently on my other show. Right. And it's like, it's crazy. The traffic mm. growth, because here's the thing. People want to be part of something, mm -hmm. right? They want to be part of a movement. They want to be, you know, that's why, you know, everything's a nation, mm -hmm. right? Red Sox nation, Patriots nation, Fire Astros nation. nation, Fire Nation. Everybody's got a nation. Um, if you can make people like part of the growth of your show, mm -hmm. you know, ask them, you know, tell two people about our show, mm -hmm. you know, tell two people about the podcast. Making It's funny, making people affiliates, mm -hmm. right? Because then they're really invested, helps your growth. You know, and one one of the one of the, the greatest pieces of, you know of advice along the lines of what Kristen's talking about, you know, is you know, you know, was I think Tim Graw, I got this from Tim Graw, I think, which is, you know, one of the great things when you're trying to build a buzz for your new book coming out is actually take your 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 possible logos, your possible book covers, these kind of things, run them in front, have your audience improve them. And even if it's not necessarily their direct input, which gets it to the final result, if what they said is in there somewhere, it gives them ownership. Yeah, it gives them a stake in what you're doing. It becomes part of them. They become more invested in what you're doing, which is why we lean so hard on you guys. Is because we know that you can help make the show better, and when you help make the show better, it becomes more your show too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was funny. Like John Acuff, I can't remember what book he did this in. Um, but one of his books, he has a group called 30 Days of Hustle. And if you were in that group, I you could, over. I think it was do over. You could submit your name, you know, as somebody is, that's a member of the group and you'd say how you want it presented. And he would put your, he put your name in the book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people bought the book just because they knew their name was in the book. And they told their family about it. You know, there's a pride in it. Yeah. Right, because you're like, my name is my name is in John's book. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. You know, so even like things like that. And it's funny because like he said like when he went to his publisher and he was going to, you know, he want, he pitched this. Like I want like nine pages added to the book so I can put all these names in the book. They're like, you're nuts. Yeah, they're like, you're crazy. It's nine pages in a hardcover book. That's And he's like, trust me. It's worth it. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, because there are people who are invested in this. I've seen this a lot of Kickstarters for movies and stuff where, you know, you get to a certain level and you get your names in the credits, sometimes under a title if you give enough mm -hmm. money. Executive producer. Yes. Well, uh, according to my people who've worked in movies, executive producers are that because yeah, they're the money, money. people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, exactly. No, we like, there's, a, I, there's one Kickstarter we did that made a movie and we're mm -hmm. like executive mm -hmm. producers on the movie. So, you know, stuff like that. You're like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And we watch uh, it just to see our names. Yep. So, um, you know, I think the best way to build an audience is to always think of that audience mm -hmm. first. Right. And if you always focus on them, then you're going to create that good mm -hmm. content. You know, you're going to be cognizant of their time. Mm -hmm. You're going to do the thing, you know, you're going to expose them to new people that you think are awesome. And then those people are going to expose you to their folks. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these things come really naturally mm -hmm. when your audience focuses. Yeah, start in those areas. When you get good at those, that's when you start worrying about how can I get on to you know, uh, edu or, or .gov sites. How could I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, an edu would probably a lot easier than a .gov site, but, um, but you know, start working on those things first. You know, there is a certain word of mouth growth you can do. Be honest and upfront. And if you really need a growth in your audience, provide that ask earlier in the conversation. Remember, fifteen seconds mm -hmm. on a web page. You know, depending on the YouTube channel, three minutes. Yep. No, absolutely. So, you know, the more important it is, the sooner you need to get it out and make those asks, you know, and if people like your content, they will. Right. And that, that's really the thing, you know, you know, we've been saying on the show that you are just, you know, you're one step away from getting your business mm -hmm. where you want it to be. Maybe this is the step that you're mm -hmm. missing, you know, try it out and see if it works for you. Thank you so much for being with us again this week. Um, 
we hope that we're providing value for you. If we are, you know, we'd love to have you, you know, review the show, however you're listening and let people know that, you know, we're providing value for small business owners. So thanks so much. We'll see you next week. (laughs) Here's my quick emotional input for the episode. This was Small Business Life.